The Cincinnati Bengals have announced a major investment into Paycor Stadium. Let's talk about why that matters for lease negotiations. You are Locked On Bengals, your daily Cincinnati Bengals podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What up, Bengals fans, and welcome to another episode of the Lockdown Bengals Podcast. I'm your host, Jake Lisko. He's your host, James Rapine. We're part of the Lockdown Podcast Network here on Lockdown Bengals, covering your team every day, available on YouTube and everywhere you get your podcast. Shout out to all the first listeners, those of us who make us your first listener, and all the everydayers out there who don't miss a day of the Locked On Bengals podcast, maybe using your commute, putting us on in the car on your way to work as a way to make us part of your everyday routine. Appreciate all of you who participate daily with our content. And today we're going to talk about why this big investment that the Bengals have announced is so important, where the money is coming from, what Hamilton County thinks about it. And some of you have been asking about what's going on with the Bengals' upcoming lease renewal requirement and the negotiations with the city and nothing has really happened for months on this front until this big announcement from the Bengals on Tuesday night. Yeah, it's huge. It's huge for a bunch of reasons. One, everyone remembers the 90s or has an idea of the 90s or, or how it went down even if you're 22 and, and you don't necessarily remember it was it got ugly at times and i hope it doesn't get ugly this time and it sounds like the bengals and the county and the nfl uh, are going to be able to revamp paycor stadium and not have to rebuild the stadium or build a new stadium or move the stadium somewhere else like to the burbs like uh, our friends up north in cleveland are having the debate right now it sounds like they're going to be able to stay put and, and stay downtown and stay right there where they should in my opinion and everything can be hunky-dory with a, a new revitalized stadium or new revitalized updates to a stadium that isn't that old now say what you want about paycor stadium I do think it can be updated and be really nice and it needs to be updated. There are a lot of things that need updating, whether it's TVs, whether it's suites, whether it's all of the, the things that impact the, the fan experience in this modern day NFL. And I think the Bengals know that the County probably knows that the NFL definitely knows it though, regardless. And so and this the is Bengals. the NFL and the Bengals and, and, and those two coming together and, and hopefully, uh, getting things on the right path where everyone can agree and get something done. And this is a loan, it appears, through the NFL's G5 loan program, which is a, a set of money that the owners have set aside for teams to apply for, for improvements to stadiums. It's on the heels of the previous G4 loan program for stadium, stadium improvements. So it's a relatively new program. Comes on the heels of the $40 million in upgrades the Bengals have done with things like improving the locker room and other fan-facing improvements that the team has previously announced. The big stipulation for G5 money is that it must be spent on fan-facing elements. So this 100 to $120 million that the Bengals have announced must be spent on those things you're talking about, James. The, the screens and TVs around the stadium the suites and seats and concessions and other fan game day experience items that this team has on their list of to-dos, it's going toward those places. And the G5 money is actually pretty interesting, the way that it all works. We can break that down as well. But one of the, the key elements there is that it must be spent on fan-facing elements. So this money, while they've made improvements to the locker room, they made improvement to their training facilities in recent years, this money will go toward improving things that you will see when you are attending games at Paycor. Yeah, you can't take this and build an indoor facility where the cement factory is, for example. Like that, that's they're not going to pay for it themselves. How, how it works. Yeah, that's not how it works. So uh, even though, man, cement factory, get the hell out of there. 
Yeah. Side note. Anyway, so it's the most annoying thing in the world, and it makes no sense on the river. I don't care how long it's been there. Uh, you mentioned G5 money. You got that G6 money, by the way. I almost interrupted you about seven times because Jake Lisko definitely fly, flies private when he's coming uh, from Vancouver uh, Island to Cincinnati back home. Mm -hmm. That said, yeah, I think this is good because the fans are going to see the improvements, and it it's going to be done or scheduled to be done by the 2026 season. So you'll see some of it now, of course. They're redoing the field, which you'll notice, but they're, they're redoing a bunch of seats now. I think they're going to be doing a lot of TVs this offseason, maybe all of the TVs this offseason. And, and so, and, and I don't know if that was necessarily discussed anywhere, but I, I am pretty sure that's going to happen. So the fan experience impact is going to happen now. So you're going to notice it in September when you're watching Bengals Patriots or this preseason. And, and so that's, that's the beauty of this is I think they, they're going to have a plan where they can get things knocked out where it impacts the fans in a positive way right away. And it isn't a, oh, this is going to be done by 2030. No, it's going to, things are going to be done and are being done right now, which I like a lot because it impacts the fans in, in a good way. And why wouldn't we want that to happen? Yeah. Agreed there. The G5 program is quite interesting as well. It's kind of alone in name only when you think about or, or understand the way it works exactly. So teams can get up to $300 million in $100 million installments or, or separate applications. So the way that this works is the NFL will give the Bengals some money. The Bengals will repay that over time with money that would normally have gone to the league anyway as part of revenue sharing. That's how the Bengals will repay the loan. So when you think about it that way, you're paying it back with money you'd be giving back to the league anyway, and then will be redistributed through revenue sharing. So it's not a loan in the traditional sense that you or I would go to the bank and take a loan and have interest rates and have to pay it all back. It's essentially a lot of free money. Maybe it's not entirely free money, but a lot of it is free money for the Bengals to do this. It's also only given to a team when the team is matching the amount that they're requesting for in the loan. And there is a public investment involved, meaning Hamilton County has involved. And the Bengals didn't specifically mention what public money was involved to help them get approval for this lease, but it's probably the recent $39 million investment that Hamilton County approved. I think it was late last year. And so if the Bengals are announcing a 50 or, or sorry, a 100 to 120 million dollar investment of, of new money that could mean it's 50 to 60 million dollars from the NFL, 50 60 million dollars from the Bengals themselves, and then you've got the additional public money element to get approval for the loan, which is more or less a grant from the NFL in this G5 program. So, those details are very interesting to me because. Mm -hmm. You think about what Hamilton County Commissioner Alicia Reese said last month when this, the county wants to see $100 million in NFL funding. Mm -hmm. And this could be the Bengals trying to get to that number to make the county happy. And when you look at what the county had to say about it, as reported by Ben Baby over on ESPN, they do seem to be pretty pleased with the Bengals' steps here to make a significant investment. Yeah, this is why it's so significant. It's not just the flat screen that you're going to be watching while you're getting a hot dog or two. Get me one, by the way, while you're in line. Uh, but it's getting the ball rolling on this stadium agreement, stadium lease. And there's like a year-by-year -year option after 2026. But we don't like going year-by-year, -year, right? That's why T. Higgins isn't in right now. You don't want to be on any one-year type deal or these options. You want to get things locked up. And so a good way to do it. And for the Bengals, as you laid out, it th this program doesn't cost them out of pocket, out of the money, uh, the the loan part. Obviously, they have to put some of their money forward. I'm not saying that. Whatever the amount is, if it's 60 million, it's 60 million. But the other element of it, it's coming from the the revenue, where the league is essentially helping the league, and it seems like a pretty darn good program for the league, for all 32 NFL teams. Makes a ton of sense. Makes sense to the owners, or for the owners, certainly makes sense in this situation. So it, it feels like it's a win-win. Now, I do think there's a little pressure on the county because it seems like the Bengals have, have held up that part of it, that request from the county. And so 
we'll, we'll see where things go from here. But this is probably the first of multiple times, Jake, I think we'll talk about this. Yeah, and the comment from the county was that the board's goal has always been a multifaceted funding approach to keep the stadium competitive, meaning PACOR, for decades to come because it is owned by the county, of course. With this new support from the NFL, this is a significant step in the direction of achieving that goal, which is where it appears that the county and administrator Jeff Aludo making this comment to Ben Baby seems pleased with the Bengals' efforts here. The Bengals also announced their Ring of Honor game, right where everyone thought it would be week three, Monday Night Football. We'll discuss the Ring of Honor coming up next. Today's show is brought to you by Yahoo Finance. When it comes to your financial future, you think you've done it all. You've saved, you've researched, you've invested all that you can, and now you need to take those investments to the next level by using something every financial great uses, Yahoo Finance. For more than 25 years, Yahoo Finance has been the brand behind every great investor. Whether you're a seasoned investor or you're looking for extra guidance, Yahoo Finance gives you the tools and data you need in one place. They are number one in producing holistic, a uh, holistic look at your financial news cycle and a number one financial destination, whether it's breaking news, original editorial perspectives, analyst ratings, independent research, customizable chart, charts, and so much more with a community of over 90 million users each month. Their real strength is helping you on your way to financial success. All you have to do for a comprehensive financial news uh, and getting the best analysis is visit the brand behind every great investor, yahoofinance.com, the number one financial destination. That's yahoofinance.com, yahoofinance.com. As expected, the Bengals Ring of Honor game will be in week three, Monday Night Football. Just like in previous years, they have primetime games early in the season. For Ring of Honor ceremonies in Cincinnati, this year follows the same pattern. Week three, Monday Night Football. Makes sense, James. Yeah, it does. It makes a ton of sense. Sign me up, and dare I say it's a must-win Ring of Honor game. Because week three, regardless of what happens, week two against the Chiefs, we're going to be saying, oh, yeah, you got to get this one. And so hopefully, regardless of who gets inducted, they – they're able to get a win, but yeah, this makes sense. And it makes sense on a, a prime time Monday night. Obviously the, the stands are going to be packed uh, with Bengals fans. You were there for the, the first ring of honor night. And, and so having it in prime time, I think is, is such a valuable thing. It's just cool. It's just cool to have it at night. It gives it a different element, a different feel. Uh, there's a different energy in the stadium already uh, because of the prime time element. And then when you throw in, the ring of honor and how long it's not lost on me, how long we talked about the Bengals needing a ring of honor, needing something like this to honor their past greats. Well, now they have it and another year's rolling around and two guys are going to get in. The Bengals continue to do a good job with this ceremony. I think it's a good plan that they've executed for three straight years now to do this on three straight, four straight, 21, 22, 23, 24. Uh, to, to put this time is on flying, a, it's fine because that 2021 game doesn't feel that long ago. To no, me. It doesn't, it doesn't. I've seen you in person twice since then. Think about that. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, and there were some years between those visits too. Uh, but the Bengals have 11 players on the list of 2024 nominees, it's the same players, no one new has been added. I keep waiting. Or I guess we all will keep waiting for guys like Geno Atkins to eventually be added to this list. There will be others as well. But still playing catch-up. And the most recent player on the list of 2024 nominees who have played a game for the Bengals is Corey Dillon, who last played for the team in 2003. But Jim Breach, James Brooks, Chris Collinsworth, Corey Dillon, David Fulcher, Tim Crumry, Dave Lapham, Max Montoya, Lamar Parrish, Bob Trumpy and Reggie Williams remain the 11 guys out of that initial list of nominees back in 21 who still need to get in. And there are some pretty clear favorites, I would say, at this point this year, James, those being Corey Dillon and Lamar Parrish. They are the favorites. I, 
I think it's interesting because I, I look at this list and I, I get the Corey Dillon all about it. Grew up watching Corey. Uh, I've met him multiple times over the years. Love his game. He deserves to be in the Ring of Honor. So I'm not debating that. But there, I, I think there's a real debate on whether or not it should be Corey Dillon this year. And I'll probably get in. It feels like it's a fan favorite and it, season ticket holders are voting. So we'll see. But when I think about it, I'm like, all right, well, Lamar Parrish, not going to debate it at all. I think you could have argued last year for Lamar. But Bob Trumpy is certainly someone that needs to be in the ring of honor. I, I mean, easily the best tight end in franchise history. So he matches that with Corey. Uh, it, we, we played with a bunch of different quarterbacks. People just don't remember. They remember the, the radio side of Trumpy or the media side of Trumpy and not necessarily the playing side just because it was so long ago. And the thing that I want, Jake, out of this is to make sure that guys get recognized when they can still enjoy the moment. And so Reggie Williams comes to mind as well. And in this year, compared to past years, I think it's much, much closer. Like Chad Johnson and Boomer Esiason are crit like way up there when it comes to Bengals history ahead of every other guy on this list. That's why they're in the, the ring of honor. Anthony Munoz, Ken Riley, uh, Ken Anderson, Willie Anderson, Paul Brown, all of those Isaac Curtis. There we go. I'll just name all of them. Those guys are clearly ahead of the 11 that are on this nominee list. There's a gap. And so now I, I think that the gap is, is clo closer in this idea that, that Corey is just lapping these other guys. It's just not true. And so I think Corey should be in. I will not be upset if it is this year, to be very, very clear, because people are going to hate this. I know it. But James Brooks deserves to be in, and James Brooks was awesome for the Bengals and has – we'll get into the stats later, I guess, but has a, a really good argument as well. He played running back. People don't necessarily remember, if you're like me in a 90s game, you don't remember – James Brooks, but you look at it and you look at four time pro bowler was on really good teams. Uh, yards per carry is up there. Dynamic weapon out of the backfield. It's like, man, can you give James Brooks to Joe Burrow right now? The point is, is he's really talented too. It's going to be hard for anyone to get it wrong, but I do think there are more than two right answers, which makes it tough because last year I thought it was obviously boomer and Chad. This year, I don't think it's nearly as obvious. Even though you're right, I, I do think that there is a social media movement, at least, where it's Corey Dillon and Lamar Parrish are head and shoulders above the rest, and, and I don't buy that. I can understand where the argument is coming from. Corey Dillon obviously had a bit of a podcast tour last year where he <laughs> expressed his desire to be recognized for what he did in Cincinnati and in the pro football hall of fame. He's one of the few players on this list. I think that has a really strong argument to be in the pro football hall of fame. If not the only player remaining on this list or, or the strongest player remaining on this list in terms of an argument for being in the pro football hall of fame. I think that does help his cause quite a bit, but when you look at the list and you talk about the drop off from the previous players to the players remaining, well, and you think about, if Andrew Whitworth and Geno Atkins were on this list, for example, where would Whitworth slot in in the pecking order? Where would Geno Atkins slot in in the pecking order? And the that, answer is that, one and two. I, they would be very high on the list. And I know they're recent <laughs> and they're going to have to wait a little bit longer as the Bengals yeah. work through their backlog. But those guys were the top of their position for this team for longer than almost anyone else on this list, maybe besides Reggie Williams, who played for the, the Bengals from 1976 to 1989. Uh, I guess Jim Breach also 1980 to 1992. But those guys were, were huge stalwarts in Bengals history as well. And at this point, when you look at the, the list of nominees, we're at the point where none of these guys don't belong in the Ring of Honor. Maybe you can make arguments for a couple that should be on the fringes if you really wanted to. But most of these guys were instrumental pieces in Bengals history who will be in the ring of honor at some point. And now we're just trying to decide in what order do they go in? And that mm -hmm. is what makes it more challenging this year. We can continue to discuss the cases for Corey Dillon, for Lamar Parrish, for James Brooks. I got some more for you. Yeah. To finish the show here coming up next. 
Today's show is brought to you by Game Time. The Ring of Honor game is here. We know it. It's week three, Monday night football. And if you're looking for some prime time tickets under the lights for Paycor Stadium, well, go to Game Time. You download the Game Time app and they have all in prices, views from your seat. They have a lowest price guarantee and they take the guesswork out of buying NFL tickets. So whether it's week three at Paycor Stadium, whether you want to hit the road and go to Dallas for Monday night football or go to MetLife Stadium in New York for Sunday night football against the Giants, Game Time is the app to download now. And of course, it's not just NFL, any live event, concerts. If you want to go uh, catch a, an NBA Eastern Conference Finals game in Indianapolis, Cincinnatians, what's a 90 minute drive, no brainer. And you can get your tickets with Game Time. Also, Obviously, Reds tickets, they're on a long homestand right now. So get your tickets to whatever event you're looking for today by downloading the Game Time app. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NFL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code Locked On NFL, L O C K E D O N NFL for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, Jake, I have a number for you. Just because no one watched Bob Trumpy. No one did. You know, maybe some of our listeners did, but it's it's a small percentage, right? Bob Trumpy. His second year in the NFL. I'm gonna I'm gonna be sure because I looked this up a few years ago for End of the Jungle. His second year in the NFL, yeah. He was an all pro. This is 1969. It's the Bengals' second year of existence on all pro. He averaged 22.6 yards per catch. Just insane for a tight end. Started all 14 games. This wasn't a passing league, right? Averaged almost 23 yards per catch. No tight end would do that today. It's just insane. So I just, I would seriously consider Trumpy. And he was an all-pro, uh, four-time Pro Bowler, I want to say. I'm checking to make sure. Yeah, four-time Pro Bowler, one-time all-pro. Averaged 15 yards a catch for his, his career, by the way. It's not like it was just one year and then he was averaging eight yards a catch. It was not Dink and Duncan but with Bob Trumpy. So. Just someone that I would throw out there because the numbers, you look at them, and it's like, oh, in a non, non-passing non league, those numbers are kind of crazy. And how much does his radio and TV career factor in? How much should those things factor into these decisions? Because a big reason that Dave Lapham is on this list, and deservedly so, is because of his imprint on Bengals fans as a member of the game day radio team and what he's done in Bengals related media specifically in, in Lapham's case. And, and that's also applicable to Bob Trumpy. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. I mean, everything he did media wise. I, I mean, I think he's easily the best tight end in Bengals history. And again, the numbers you got to weigh in the era, if you look at just yards, but ugh, I, it's tough. It's tough to leave him out. And then the other part of this is age again. And, and that, that would be a factor. If I had a vote, that would matter. And you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring for any of these guys. So you, you you could argue, you could make that argument. But I do know that age, father time, it's undefeated. And so if it's close between two guys, would I go with the guy that should have been in when Corey was playing? Because that's when Bob Trumpy should have been inducted into the Bengals ring of honor. Probably around the time that, that Corey Dillon uh, was running at Synergy Field, not even Paycor Stadium. To, to give you an idea, or Paul Brown Stadium, as it was at the time when he broke the rushing record. That's how long ago it should have been. So it's, it's tough because at some point, and maybe it's not this year, and maybe people disagree and think Corey Dillon and Lamar Parrish are the last two that, that should be in, and then there's that drop-off where everyone's together that needs to be in, and there isn't uh, as much of a gap, even though I think that's already happened. It, at some point, the age part of it should be a factor. And I, I would struggle not to, to look at that this year because, I again, I think there is that gap. And, and I do wonder how fans view it. And, and Lapham's in there, too. You, you want to get Lapham in sooner rather than later. You don't want him to, to be 80 like Trumpy and, and still not be in and on the outside looking in. So I, I do think that that's, that would be a factor for me, put it that way. Yeah, Bob Trumpy turned 79 in March this year. 
And if it is indeed Corey Dillon, Lamar Parrish, Lamar Parrish, who came into the league just two years after Bob Trumpy, Bob Trumpy came into the league the earliest on this list of players in 1968, Lamar Parrish in 1970, uh, Corey Dillon, the most recent, you would be picking off both ends of the extremes here a little bit with Lamar Parrish and Corey Dillon, but Bob Trumpy, the oldest or the, the longest ago entered the NFL. And, and as you mentioned, would be 80 if he's not in this year as he's looking at this uh, process next year. If I voted today, and I, by the way, if I'm a season ticket holder, I wouldn't vote today. Voting's open. I would be doing some research. I, I would, hell, I'd probably pull up games on YouTube. I would take it we're probably way too serious, honestly. <laughs> I, honestly, because you, yeah. you want to remember. Yeah. You want to remember and actually make the right decision. I, I would probably take it way too serious. But as of today, I would vote for Lamar Parrish and Bob Trumpy. Those are the two I would vote for. And I know that won't be popular on social media, which I'm okay with. Well, this is something that we talked about when they introduced the concept of the Ring of Honor and how the voting worked. And, you know, the, the amount of seasons you have as a season ticket holder, you, your votes count that many times or your votes count for more. And one of the things that we discussed was, will there be a tendency toward the more recent and memorable players in terms of guys that are fresher in the mind or well, the season ticket holders who have been going down to Bengals games for 40 years or 50 years, the people that are sometimes in our comments and in our Twitter mentions and in our DMs reminding us of things that, I mean, I know you've written the history book. I have not written the history book uh, as over your head there. You've got your, your enter the jungle Bengals history book there for those watching on YouTube. But the, the guys that were around in the Trumpy era, would those guys be the, will we go and try to catch up with the, the history first? And that's not the way it's gone. It has skewed very offensive for one and uh, very recent in, in recent years, Willie Anderson, Chad Johnson, Boomer Siason being the, the last three inductees, all of those being very recent players after the inaugural class, Ken Anderson, Anthony Munoz, Ken Riley, and, and of course, Paul Brown going back a little bit further into the history book. Since then, it's been Isaac Curtis and three much more modern players that have gone into the Ring of Honor for the Cincinnati Bengals. It's also been a bunch of offensive players, as mm -hmm. Ken Riley is the only defensive player in the Bengals Ring of Honor. So it would be good to catch up on some of these defensive players, for one. And, and two, it is interesting to see where there's an emphasis on the, the older history versus the recency with Corey Dillon being the, the only player left with late 90s, early 2000s experience with the Bengals to be inducted. And after that, it's going to force fans and the Ring of Honor to look further back in the history books if Corey does go in this year. Yeah. I Again, to me, that's exactly why I would prioritize that and, and try to remember or research go back heck by enter the jungle and realize realize how good some of these guys were i get it i've lived in the Corey era i so it would be real easy for me to say best running back in Bengals history like everyone is saying but if you talk to people that watch the 80s or that were there for the 80s or that was their era they would say actually james brooks was better there are a lot of people that feel that way that he's the best running back in Bengals history and it is not that the gap isn't that huge. And, and you notice I haven't brought up James Brooks a ton yet from a, I vote for him this year. It's, it's, it's because it's really, really tough. I think Lamar Parrish is a no brainer. And I, I think Bob Trumpy is too. And what, what's, what makes it tough is you get two. Mm -hmm. And, and so if I was in the Jeff Hobson does this for uh, the, the hall of fame at the pro football hall of fame, he makes the case for the, the Bengals players. Obviously, he was a big part of getting Ken Riley into the Hall of Fame. That would be my pitch, is looking at Bob Trumpy and how easy it is to forget how great he was. And I think the same thing goes for Lamar Parrish. People are remembering Lamar. Leaping Lamar, like you have the, the element of it that I think some people remember or that carries with him, whatever it is, the swag or whatever it is, the production, obviously, that, that people remember. Trumpy was productive too. And I like he he has to get serious consideration from fans. As do a lot of these guys, by the way. 
uh, this is just my my Trumpy rant. I know we're going to have time to to talk about some of these other guys between now and, and when the the finalists are announced and when the the actual inductees are announced. Yeah, we'll probably revisit this at least once, if not twice, between now and the Ring I'm of Honor. Watch game. some film, baby. <laughs> Go fire up your 1970s Bengals games, dude. I you can find anything if you really try. That's going to do it for this episode of the Locked so? On Bengals Fuck. No, I'm not disagreeing. I'm just ending no. the show. I'm going to email the Bengals right now. I want Bob Trumpy highlights. Thank you. It'd be cool for them to put together highlight reels for all these guys, actually. I actually just found one. Um, Bob Trumpy against the Chiefs, 1969. There you go. There are uh, descriptions of each player on the list with Dave Lapham's take on each of them, except himself, over on Bengals.com. You can check out if you want to get a quick synopsis. You can also, of course, check out James's book. But that is going to do it for this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Let us know who you think should be in the Ring of Honor in the comments. Until next time, thanks for listening to this episode of the Locked On Bengals podcast. Hootay, and have a good one.